Here we are in week nine of administrative law. Let's see what we've got here. Standing typically is an issue where the plaintiff complains of agency action with respect to some third party. Uh, that font is called Sans Forgetica, downloadable for free at sansforgetica.rmit. It is a font that has been scientifically designed using principles of psychology to improve retention of written information. By disrupting the flow of individual letter forms, readers are subtly programmed to increase their focus on the text being communicated. So write the authors of this, or originators of this font, Drs. Janica Bill Levens and Joe Perryman. They developed this font using principles of psychology fused with type design to create a condition known as desirable difficulty. A desirable difficulty is an obstruction to a learning process that requires a considerable but desirable amount of effort, thereby improving retention and recalled information. And now for some more undesirable difficulty. Article three jurisdiction exists only if the plaintiff can show some injury in fact, actual or imminent to some interest, economic, aesthetic, scientific, or recreational. The injury must also be traceable to the agency action complained of and redressable by the court. The APA requires that any non-constitutional interest plaintiff asserts must fall within the zone of interest created by a relevant statute. An injury to an interest in lawful government is a generalized grievance that is not concrete and personalized enough to count as an injury in fact. The plaintiff can show an injury in fact related to an agency's procedural laxity with respect to a third party. Traceability and addressability requirements may be relaxed. We now turn to another topic. The question is not whether or not there is judicial review or whether or not a proper plaintiff is seeking the court's help. Rather, the question is, is it time for judicial review? Our leading case is Abbott Labs versus Gardner. Abbott Labs is a case brought by a drug company to challenge a rule made by the FDA. The FDA rule required drug labels and packages to print the scientific name of the drug alongside each use of the drug's proprietary name. For example, Niaspan, pictured here, is really only niacin. Knowing this, a consumer would be able to compare prices for niacin sold generically or in another proprietary time-released brand. The FDA moved the court to dismiss the suit on the ground that judicial review was not available until the FDA initiated some enforcement action, which the FDA had not yet done. Under the APA, only final agency action is reviewable. In the later case of Bennett versus Speer, the court explained the meaning of the word final in the APA. Not tentative or interlocutory. This simply tells us what a final agency action is not, not what it is. What is it to be a final non-tentative action? The court added, legal consequences flow. The FDA rule in Abbott Labs is final because legal consequences flowed once the rule emerged from the notice and comment rulemaking process. Or rather, as we shall see, they flowed once 30 days had elapsed since the FDA published its rule in the Federal Register and styled it as a final rule. From that day forward, the rule was legally binding on all drug makers and distributors and sellers. They all had legal duties, which of course the FDA might not instantly enforce. But a valid rule is binding from the moment it is uh, final. 
the every time rule was final. Isn't that all the APA requires? No, there's more. The Emmett Labs court wrote, a further inquiry must, however, be made. Injunctive and declaratory judgment remedies are equitable in nature and hence discretionary. The Chancellor in equity will not grant a remedy unless the final agency action also possesses ripeness. How is a court in equity to decide whether final agency action is ripe for judicial review? We know how to judge whether a tomato is ripe, but how can a court tell whether an agency action is ripe for review? Ripeness equals finality plus, plus something else. Abbott Labs tells us that ripeness means finality plus something else. Well, two somethings. X equals fitness and hardship, the court explains. Ripeness has a twofold aspect requiring us to evaluate both the fitness of the issues for legal, legal decision and the hardship to the parties of withholding court consideration. Looking at the allegations of the complaint, the court notes the issue raised is a purely legal one. Has the FDA acted ultra vires, that is, outside the boundaries of its statutory mandate? Issues of statutory construction are normally fit for judicial review. Even if some kind of deference is owed to the agency's construction, the issue is ready to go. But another factor comes into the balance, the hardship to the parties of delaying review. Looking mainly to the plaintiffs, the court describes a cruel dilemma in which they are placed. If they comply with the rule, and it is later set aside, they will have had to throw out supplies of packaging and to forgo exploiting their brand. On the other hand, if they continue to do business as usual, and the rule is later enforced and upheld, they face the prospect of civil penalties and bad publicity. The court does not dwell upon the hardship to the agency of going forward with immediate judicial review. Is there no hardship to the agency? If not, why should the agency care whether there is judicial review now or judicial review later? In fact, why wouldn't the agency welcome the earliest opportunity to vindicate the legality of the rule? The answer is that the FDA would like to choose where the validity of the every time rule is first litigated. In short, it wants to retain the power to forum shop. If pre-enforcement review is available to regulated parties, the FDA loses that advantage and the regulated parties gain it. The U.S. Courts of Appeal form 11 circuits. Some circuits, as we shall see, are reputed to be more business-friendly and anti-regulatory than others. For example, the Fourth Circuit, which sits in Richmond, is said to be distinctly more favorable to corporate and business plaintiffs than to the federal agencies. Conversely, the Ninth Circuit is often said to be the reverse. The D.C. Circuit, which sits in the nation's capital, has the greatest administrative law caseload and the most extensive body of circuit precedent. There is no rule of inter-circuit stare decisis. Decisions of other circuits are persuasive but not necessarily binding authority. That is why the U.S. Supreme Court frequently grants certiorari to address a circuit split to bring uniformity across the federal circuits. The court in Abbott Labs evidently did not think the loss to the federal agencies of this advantage was great enough to tip the balance of hardships. The cruel dilemma facing the drug companies was a serious hardship. The loss by the agency of a tactical advantage was not. The court held for the FDA in a separate ripeness case decided the same day. In Toilet Goods 1, the court held unripe a challenge to an FDA regulation 
that gave it the power to suspend the certification of drug companies that did not consent to surprise inspections. The rule was final, but the issue of its legality was not yet fit for judicial review, nor was there hardship to the plaintiff in delaying review until the rule was enforced. The issue of the rule's validity was not purely legal for its resolution dependent in part on the FDA's enforcement resources and responsibilities, which only a factual record could illuminate. Moreover, there was no immediate hardship to be borne by the drug company plaintiffs. The FDA inspectors might never show up. In a companion case, Toilet Goods 2, the court did find the challenge to be uh, ripe, awkward term in the context, I apologize. In Toilet Goods 2, the FDA rule reclassified food colorings as coming within the agency's jurisdiction. This meant that the plaintiff's products were subject to a range of other regulations once the rule was final. The issue of whether the FDA rule was ultra-virus was held, as in Abbott Labs, to be purely legal. And delaying review was a hardship to the plaintiffs because, unlike Toilet Goods 1, the rule affected their primary conduct. In other words, the rule imposed burdensome legal duties upon the drug companies as soon as the rule was final, just as in Abbott Labs. To have had to wait for judicial review would have subjected the companies to the same kind of cruel dilemma. We complete our look at timing doctrines now, revisiting one we touched on before in connection with Block versus Community Nutrition Institute, the doctrine of exhaustion. I will try to wrap this up quickly. First, let's distinguish exhaustion from finality. Luckily, we have a definitive explanation from our highest court. In Darby v. Cisneros, the court wrote, the finality requirement is concerned with whether the initial decision maker has arrived at a definitive position on the issue that inflicts an actual concrete injury. The exhaustion requirement generally refers to administrative procedures by which an injured party may seek review of an adverse decision and obtain an administrative remedy if the decision is found to be unlawful or otherwise inappropriate. In other words, finality looks to see whether there's anything the agency has yet to do before the legal position of the plaintiff is altered. Exhaustion, on the other hand, looks to see whether the plaintiff could avoid injury by getting the agency to correct itself. The APA provides, except as otherwise expressly required by statute, agency action otherwise final is final. Well, final means final. Whether or not there has been presented or determined an application for an appeal to superior agency authority. The availability of intra-agency remedies does not postpone finality. Unless the agency otherwise requires by rule and provides that the action meanwhile is inoperative. The court adds, courts are not free to impose an exhaustion requirement as a rule of judicial administration where the agency action has already become final under APA section 704. The court adds, where the APA applies, an appeal to superior agency authority is a prerequisite to judicial review only when expressly required by statute or when an agency rule requires appeal before review and the administrative action is made inoperative pending that review. The APA codifies exhaustion doctrine and precludes judicial enlargement. What happens to a plaintiff who is required to exhaust, but instead goes straight to court? There are cases in which a plaintiff has been barred from seeking judicial review on the ground of failure to exhaust. But after Darby v. Cisneros, such cases might not still be good law. Well, it's getting late. Let me tax your patience no further. <laughs>